of Isaiah. We're going to do chapter 11, verses 1 through 16 tonight. And I titled this one. Usually I don't title them, but what are you waiting for? So let me ask a question. How many of you would say, man, I'm waiting for something? Maybe it's a, maybe it's a check to come in the mail. Maybe it's an answer to prayer. How many would say it? That you're waiting for something. Five of us would say that. Everybody else received everything you got. All right. So we're waiting for something. So we all have that spot. So obviously this should be able to talk and speak to all of us. So tonight we, we uh, move on to the third oracle or prophetic saying from the lips of Isaiah. I told you what an oracle was last week. It's a saying that comes directly from God into someone. Uh, there were secular oracles. The oracle of Delphi will be there in, uh, in uh, March as we go to Greece to see that spot. So he's giving an oracle. He's a proclamation to Judah. Now he's just given some. Uh, get, these were judgments against the enemies of Israel, Ephraim and Assyria. And then he gives an oracle of the remnant, the ones that are left after the Babylonian captivity. And now he gives an oracle that's, a, that's that for Judah, but it's very far reaching. So get ready because this is one of the most complete prophecies concerning the life of Messiah to come, Jesus. Uh, when I read it, I am stunned by the amazing predictions of who and what the Messiah will be and how Isaiah, 750, 740 years before Christ was born, writes of him like he personally knows him. It's nothing short of the Holy Spirit giving Isaiah the, de the details of Christ's life uh, from birth all the way through his millennial reign yet to come. So don't read it. You don't want to read it yet. You want to follow it. So... As we study the words tonight, don't take them for granted. Let them sink deep into your spirit. They're all about Jesus. And if you ever have a conversation with a Jewish friend, and I know Andy would, his family's Jewish, uh, about Jesus, you want to make them look at Isaiah chapter 11. It's in their Torah. You want to ask them who it's about. It's a detail of Christ's life. Ask who is this talking about. So tonight, let me tell you in a story form about what's going on. And then let's listen to what the prophet Isaiah was looking forward to and waiting for and eagerly anticipating. I asked you who's waiting for something. Isaiah was waiting for something. It was, here's the story. It was not a happy time for the people of Israel. The Assyrians were encamped right across the valley at Nob. And so as they're camped at Nob, and I told you last week, this is, this is, the, this is the Mount of Olives. This is, this is where they're camped, at the Mount of Olives. Sorry. This is where they're camped, at the Mount of Olives, Nob. So Jerusalem, called Jebus in his time, uh, in, this is before, before Isaiah, uh, City of Peace, they're camped right here. There's a valley, the Kidron Valley is here. There's an, another valley that runs this way, the Tyropian Valley. There's another valley that runs this way, which is the valley of the Tyropian Valley and Gehenna Valley. Tyropian Valley are a valley of cheesemakers. So it actually forms this, and I showed you before, it forms this. That's a shin. That is, a, it's a Hebrew letter that means blessing. So uh, it, Jerusalem is right in the middle of God's blessings. The Assyrians in 740 BC, a little history for you, are encamped. They're ready to take, they've been sweeping across the world. They've been taking everything, every city. There, there's there's uh, article after article, archaeological article. There's biblical articles that tell you about every city they've taken. They, they name them. They've conquered the world. So they're right ready to take Jerusalem. Tiny Jerusalem. It's, it's nothing compared to the cities that they've conquered. It does have a wall. It does have an outside water source that's hidden but they're having trouble conquering it. So they're encamped there. They're encamped right across the border. The Assyrians are ready to, to uh, pounce and destroy Jerusalem and carry the people away into captivity, just like they did the northern kingdom. The glorious tree that had been Israel is now about to be reduced to a stump. Uh, they're ready to destroy it. It's in that setting of despair that Isaiah looks for something, uh, something uh, surprising and something that... Uh, that uh, surprising to grow from that stump. He's looking for something. It's a prophecy of, of hope. And so uh, they're camped right here. They're looking over at the temple. They're looking for, that's the actual spot that they're looking from. As a matter of fact, that's the Mount of Olives. They're looking over at either up and down that. So he sees a stump. And Isaiah's going to talk about a stump. Again, we're going a little ahead. You haven't seen it yet. But you'll read about a stump. And he sees something coming out of the stump. So what was he waiting for in his time? The stump represents Israel cut down to nothing. The, the mighty Israel down to nothing. Assyrians, Assyrians are, are pursuing uh, and ready to conquer it. So what expectations did Isaiah have for that child that he wrote about in chapter 11? Because he's going to write about a child. In the midst of all this, this destruction, he's going to write about a little child uh, who we now know would be born in Bethlehem stable. He's writing about Christ. In chapter 11, Isaiah points a vivid picture of what he was waiting for. And in so doing, he gives us the most complete composite of the life of Christ, of Jesus of Nazareth, from the cradle all the way to his millennial reign beyond us. As we cover chapter 11 tonight, you and I can see what Isaiah could only imagine. A savior growing out of a stump, and he will call it that. It's pretty powerful. So let me give you a little bit of the, uh, the how it breaks down outline form for us. So he sees this. Isaiah tells us of the Messiah, Jesus to come. 
He sees the seed of a Savior, chapter 11, verse 1, the spirit of the Savior, the governance of the Savior, the peace of the Savior, Savior, and the signs of the Savior. So let's start with the first one. Let's talk about the seed of a Savior. In Isaiah 1.1, 1, 1, and I'll give it to you from the King James and from the uh, message, he says this, and it's right here. He says, Then shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, by the way, proper name, shall grow out of his roots. If you remember my star study, the only woman in the sky of the 12, of the 12 signs of the, of the uh, Maseroth, the uh, astrology calls it a zodiac, but it was there way before astrology, is Virgo the Virgin. She's holding a branch in her, si in her hand, and there's a, there's a star called Spica. Spica actually means the branch. It's a 5,000-year-old name. And so it's written in the stars, Psalm 19. So the branch shall grow out of his roots, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon. Let me read it again. There shall come a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon. Why is that so interesting to us? Because for 10 chapters, he's been talking about destruction. He's not talked about any promises of anything. In the, in the, uh, the message says, a green shoot will sprout from Jesse's, from Jesse's stump, from his roots, a budding branch, his life-giving spirit of God will hover over him. So we're seeing this prophecy that's pretty powerful, just stuck right in there, uh, that's kind of interesting to me. Out of the same promise of the remnant, remember he was talking about that, Isaiah prophesied 740 years into the future. This is a prophecy 740 years to come. It's the Christmas story in the Old Testament. A child will be born, a holy seed is coming, a stem in the land. He sees the holy seed growing into a shoot from the stem of Jesse. So he sees this this shoot coming out. Even Paul alludes to the fact that even Israel today has been cut down. It's been cut down, but don't go against the stump because something can grow out of that stump. And this is what happens. This is what, Je what he's talking about. Something's going to come to restore them. Why Jesse? Well, Jesse is the father of, and I'm going to give you this chronology, go through it for you because it's pretty interesting. So Jesse is the father of David. He has several daughters and sons. He has five other sons. We do know Shimea. He has a son by the name of Jonathan, not the Jonathan that was David's friend. That was Saul's son. Uh, he has another son, Eliab. He has Zariah, who has Amasa, Abish, excuse me, who has Abishai, who's a warrior under David, Joab, who's a general, and Ashel, killed by Abner. So all these men are his nephews, David's nephews, and they fight for him. He's his general. Uh, you have, sometimes we don't put these things together, so I like to put them together. Is that all right? Yes. Of course it is. I'm teaching it. All right, here you go. Daughter Abigail. Somebody said to me when I say things like that that I'm pretty cocky. I'm not cocky. I'm just trying to be funny. All right. Ad Abigail, and she has a massa. He, he joined Absalom in a rebellion against David. That was a, that was a nephew that went against David. If you went down, David's, David's lineage goes down to Adonijah. He's a rival of Solomon and to, exceed, to succeed David. He was the one that wanted to be the king. And David actually was, was convinced by Bathsheba his wife to put Solomon. Solomon has Rehoboam, and Rehoboam is uh, the one that causes the split of the nation. He also has by Bathsheba Nathan, that is not the prophet Nathan. This one is named after the prophet. It's one of Bathsheba and David's sons, and 13 more. So you don't hear about them because they're not part of the story. Isn't that Bible study in itself, isn't it? And then you see over here, you see that uh, David also has Adonijah, of course, and Tamar, he, she's raped by her brother Ammon, and then Absalom kills Ammon. And so you see, and Joab, by the way, will kill Absalom. He's the general. So it's all in the family. So when you see this, you're talking about uh, Ammon raping Tamar. Absalom kills Ammon. Joab puts three darts in him while he hangs from his hair from a tree. They're all related to David. So you thought you had family problems. <laughs> so, so what we're taking you there is here. So Isaiah's talking about Jesse. Jesse has David. David through Bathsheba has Solomon. Solomon has Rehoboam. And you feel that all the way down, Jesus will come from him, from Rehoboam. And then on the other side of Jesus' lineage, Nathan will actually be an ancestor of Mary. And so you see he has double lineage to, to uh, Judah, double lineage to the tribe of Judah, double lineage to David. So uh, it's pretty powerful when he says it. He says, a, tr a branch shall come out of Jesse, which means that down this line, down this line, there's going to come a Messiah. Now again, he's talking about it, and he is, and it's going to be way, way down in the future, but that's what he's setting you up to tell you that. So, now this is really prophesying, not some generic, you'll have a great future, or wait till the doors open for you, or I see prosperity down the line for you. That's mumbo-jumbo Christianity. When somebody says they're a prophet, and they give you something that's very generic, that's not prophets. If they give you specifics, that's a prophet. And he goes on to give us a little bit more. He says this, um, uh, and it goes away on, by the way. Only the most calloused of critics would try to deny that this oracle, this proclamation, this pronouncement 
or announcement uh, that announces Jesus as Messiah is wrong. Remember, in an earlier passage, Isaiah introduced the Messiah as the prince of five names. We went over that in chapter 9, verse 6, with an emphasis upon his attributes. He said he had wisdom, power, love, and peace. He's prophesying about Messiah. Now Isaiah will build those virtues into the promises for his, for his uh, character, Christ's character, his, his governance, and his kingdom. He then tells us this the spirit of the Savior. So he's going on, he's prophesying about this Messiah coming because they're in trouble. They're, they're waiting for something. No, no help is coming. And so he gets this, this prophecy and it's a powerful prophecy, not just for his people of his time to give him hope, but all the way down the line when Christ is born. Isaiah 11, 2 and 3 tells us about that. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. Just think of the woman at the well, by the way. Uh, or decide by what he hears with his ears. He's not going to judge but because somebody sold, told him something, or even because he sees something. He's going to judge from the heart. So the Spirit of the Lord is inseparable, by the way, from the character of God. Let me repeat that. The Spirit of the Lord is inseparable from the character of Christ or the character of God. When God calls one, someone to a divine mission or a holy task, he gives the one he calls the indwelling of the Spirit, the ability to do it. I had a quote that I've done long, long time ago, so I'm going to quote myself, which is kind of prideful, and I don't mean any pride by that. It's just something I've said a long, long time. Whom God calls, He qualifies. So if God calls you to something, He qualifies you. You know, when I was called to the ministry, I had a, I had a secular degree, and I had, I had two secular degrees. When I was called to the ministry, um, my pastor said to me, well, you know, you can't go to the ministry. You have to leave everything you had. I had two children. You've got to leave everything you have. You've got to go back to seminary and you got to, or cemetery or whatever that was. And he says, and you have to study. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm called. I feel I'm called. And uh, he said, well, you're not. And, uh, but I couldn't go to him. Listen, who God calls, he qualifies. Now, I eventually went back to school for that, but that wasn't what qualified me. It wasn't men laying their hands on me and telling me I was a bishop that qualified me. It was God that called me. If he calls you for something, he's going to qualify you. You don't, you don't say, well, I can't do that. No, if God called you, he'll qualify you. Somebody say amen to that. So the spirit of the Savior is, going to, uh, is based on the character, and, uh, which is inseparable from the, from the personage of God. We see it all through Scripture. Listen, Moses should never have been called to lead two and a half million people. He stuttered and he was meek above all men. Can you imagine? That's, that has no that has no qualifications for a leader. Yet God called him and he qualified him. Numbers eleven seventeen. How about youthful David? He had freckles. The Bible says that he was red haired and complected and had freckles and he was, he was out in the field. He wasn't even lined up for Saul to look at the sons. Uh, Jesse lined up all his sons except David. Uh, and so David was the eighth one. He had to go and call him. Uh, Saul said, don't you have another son? He said, oh yeah, he's out in the field. I didn't even think about him. I didn't think he wanted to anoint him. So the calling is always with God, with, and it's without repentance. How about lowly fig picker Amos? I'm sure he was the one that thought he was going to be called to be a, to be a uh, prophet. All recipients of the Spirit. From this, from this come six qualities that characterize the servant of the Lord. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge. These are leaders and fear of the Lord. They are the Old Testament gifts of the Spirit, by the way. And you can see them right here. So wisdom, what does it mean? It means you see God at work in your world. That's wisdom. That's real wisdom. If you see understanding, it's see how we are to live as followers of Christ. Right judgment is counsel, knowing the difference between right and wrong. Courage, fortitude, stand up for what's right. Uh, knowledge, by the way, that group that's become, that become an alternative for the Boy Scouts of America, they're standing up for what's right. Uh, courage is standing up for what's right. Knowledge, understanding the meaning of God's revelation. Reverence, which is piety. Uh, respect for God and, other, and for the church. Wonder and awe, fear of the Lord, aware of the glory and the majesty of God. So that's the qualification of good leaders. Now, I'm going to get a little bit political on you and get a little bit historical on you for America because this should apply all the way down the line for any leaders that are there. Uh, there are, these are the qualities that Isaiah found missing in the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem. It was missing. They compromised everything and they were conquered. God allowed them to be conquered. With the truth be known, most leaders in our world today lack most of these qualities. Our leaders don't have any of those qualities. Starting with the first one, wisdom. Seeing God at work in our world. You know why? We have mass public shootings. Do you know why we have mass public shootings? We've kicked God to the curb in America. And our youth have become lawless. You know, we can blame guns, you can blame mental illness, you can blame anything you want to blame. We don't have God in our, in our schools anymore. Listen to it. According to a recent article in the LA Times about the MO of shooters, mass shooters, this is what they found out. Almost all mass shooters are young. They're not old, they're young. Secondly, they're exposed to violence at a very young age. Thirdly, they had a crisis close to the time of their, of their shooting, of their rampage. Fourth, the most studied the actions of other mass shooters. They looked at other what they did as examples. And I'm going to give you my observation, my fifth point that the LA Times didn't have. 
They all went to schools where the Bible and Bible reading was prohibited. You can't tell me that's not related. They're all young. They're not older. They're all young. They all have some problem. What's going on in their lives? You can control guns. You can lock up the mentally insane. You could have red flag laws. But unless you have the wisdom to see that we need God back in America, things are going to get worse. You're not going to, you're not going to short it. It's not going to happen. You take the guns away from regular people. You, don't, you think someone's going to give up their guns, as I said before, that's intent on doing something with them? Of course not. And so you can, you can lock up the mentally insane. We used to do that. We used to lock up the mentally insane, which is horrific. So you lock up the mentally insane, you're going you're gonna to lock up a lot of innocent people that have mental problems. Not everybody who's mentally insane is going to go out and kill somebody. Come on, I don't even know what I'm talking about. But we're talking about that. Why? We're, we need to talk about the real issue. You put God back in America and you have some laws and rules that are godly beyond the world's laws and rules, you're going to see those things curb. That's why they've been increasing since 1960. Anybody know what happened in 1960? It took prayer out of school. So it's directly related. I'm not sure why some brain, brain tank doesn't say that somewhere down the line. Obviously, they've got to see it. Now listen, we'll go on a little bit further. So, Isaiah is telling us, back to Isaiah, that the character of the leaders in a society makes a difference. And it does. American politics ref reflects the change. Let me tell you how it changed, in my opinion. Anybody know what that is? Watergate. Watergate. Anybody know, how many of you do not know what Watergate was? Okay. You didn't know what Watergate was, some younger ones. Watergate was, a, was a President Richard Nixon um, breaking into the Watergate Hotel to get the secrets for the Democratic, uh, the Democratic um, presidential candidate so he could win the election. He was a Republican, so he could win the election. It was highly illegal, and then he, <coughs> and then he hit it, and he denied it. <coughs> he was, uh, artists of impeachment came out from both, both sides of, of, the, of the, the aisle from Republicans and Democrats. The world was, America was in a mess and he resigned before they can impeach him. He would have been impeached. The first president to be fully impeached, he would have been impeached. Uh, but he resigned. So the Watergate scandal did something. It's called the Watergate scandal and it did something in America. America and I don't know if Americans know it. Before Watergate, the character of a candidate for presidential leadership didn't come into question. John Kennedy was probably the worst philanthropist, the, the worst womanizer this country has ever known. I mean, Secret Service would, he had, he had a pool that he, would, that he would swim in nude with two of his secretaries every day. Uh, the Secret Service just not even, the character of the president never came into question until Watergate. When Watergate came in, now just follow my, my uh, train of thought here. Today, however, the presidency is a pinata that the liberal media pounce upon to break apart. There's nothing Trump can do that's right. Nothing. He, ha he holds the, the biggest office in the world. He's the, he's the ruler of the free world. And he is attacked constantly. Now, again, whether you like him or not, that never happened before Watergate. You know, they would never attack President. You look, at, you look at, at President Obama, they didn't attack him. You know, that, he was an exception because obviously he broke a certain, a certain barrier and became uh, the first uh, black president, and so he, they didn't attack him. But they used to be they never attacked any presidents on any side. They may attack the issues, but not personally. They wouldn't go at his character. Actually blaming Donald Trump for mass shootings. Do you know that's going on right now? They're blaming him for mass shootings. Mass shootings have happened in, in, in presidents since 1960. And these aren't the worst ones that have happened. I hate them, but they're not the worst ones. And they're blaming President Donald Trump. Can you imagine that? Blaming an individual? We didn't even blame parties. We never blamed the Republicans or the Democrats. Now we're blaming an individual, the President of the United States. It's a bad sign. You with me tonight? Yes. I believe CNN should cancel their special reports. You know, they always flash special report. I think they should cancel all that. I think they should fire all their anchors from Wolfie to Lemony. I think they should fire them all. And I think they should just flash one single news headline across the screen and run it 24-7 for 365 days a year. We hate Donald Trump. Because that's all they do. It's all hate. That's all it is. Leadership is not a haphazard role in any setting or situation. Special responsibility is given to a leader by God, and special accountability is required of a leader. Not by John Acosts everyone, or Wolf Blitz's conservatives, or Panderson Cooper. They're not the judges of leadership. The judge of leadership is God. Uh, without the Spirit of the Lord resting upon the person who is called to lead, there is a danger of becoming wise in their own eyes and, and um, prudent in their own sight. Which leads me to the Messiah's third fact. The governance of the Savior, how he governs. Now, listen to this article, this, this um, verses, because Isaiah is going to cover almost 3,000 years in this verse. Now watch. He says, 
But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Here, Isaiah tells us that the Messiah, Jesus, will stand out among every and all leader of the earth in the excellence of his governance. With righteousness at his belt and faithfulness at his sash, he will do what is right in his judgments and what is fair in his decisions. Jesus will always defend the innocent and the needy, always. And he always pronounce harsh judgment on the guilty. The two verses are the dual Messiah. It's the lion and the lamb. He's talking about someone who's meek, and he's talking about somebody who is, who is just. The meek and the bold ones, the sufferer and the punisher. Look at that slash that I put in here. These are two different eras. He, with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of this earth. That's when Jesus came the first time. He came meek and lowly, and basically he judged that the poor needed him. But look at this other one. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He never did that in, when he came the first time. That's the second coming of Christ. That's when he comes back with a rod of iron. So Isaiah, that little sash is 2,000 years plus. That's a gap of 2,000 years plus. Isaiah is going to do it again and again and again before we get through this. As a matter of fact, Jesus is going to quote Isaiah only half of a verse when we get to, when we get to Isaiah 61, and then he's going to sit down in the temple because the second half he didn't do yet. And so you're going to see this. Isaiah, I get chills thinking about it because Isaiah is giving us a complete view of Christ, not just the suffering Messiah, but also the conquering Messiah. We know that Jesus came the first time as a sufferer, as a victim, as a lamb. But we know the second time he comes is as a conqueror, as he treads down. Listen, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. That's, that's a servant's animal. But when, somebody, when a victor would come into a city, they ride on a white horse. He's coming back on a white horse. And so we see the, we see the suffering of Savior and the conquering Savior. Uh, we see these two different things. If you want to see, it's a mountain peak of prophecy, and I have to explain it a little bit for you. So Isaiah's prophesying. Now, obviously, he's thinking about Assyria. He's not thinking about the big prophecies, even though God's using them to say it. So it's called the mountain peak of prophecy. What he saw is he sees Christ, and he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about, he doesn't know that, but he's talking about it. Then there's a gap. The valley is the church. That's that sash. That's that little slash I put in there. Then he's going to see Christ coming back after the Antichrist. He's going to come back as a ruler. So he's a suffering Messiah, a conquering Messiah. This is called the mountain peak of prophecy. He's prophesying both of those at the same time in one verse. It's pretty powerful. And he does it over and over and over again. Now, get ready because I'm going to show you something that's probably going to get you excited. We desperately need this kind of leadership in America. We need Christ to lead us. Somebody say amen. I saw this picture posted the other day. How many like that picture? Don't get too excited. It's fake news. It's done by the right. That's the actual picture. Let me tell you why I told you that. It's a doctored photo of some soccer team that gave him a shirt. And basically, someone put this all over the, the internet, and it's getting thousands and thousands of views. You know why? Because we want him to be the perfect Christian leader. And so we're, we're stamping. We are so desperate. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. I'm being honest with you. I, listen, I'm going to call it like it is. Look, I'm excited about President Trump's policies. I'm excited about his views on Israel and his being a non-seasoned bureaucrat who goes through the motions. But let's see his presidency for what it is. God's using him for such a time. He is not our Savior. Amen. Just being honest with you. And don't make him our Savior. Don't try to make something. That's just as bad as the left. How many are with me? Amen. Let's be honest. Um, only Jesus will be flawless. He, only he will make 100% of right decisions. This fake photo just proves to me that we are so desperate for Jesus to rule our world. We're so desperate to line somebody up with Jesus. President Trump is the president. Whether he's a Christian or not, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's the fa fact is God can use somebody who's not a Christian. He used Cyrus, the great. So the key is he has the right policies there for Israel. I know if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. But when you try to make him something he's not, Basically, you're just as bad as the left is. Am I right? All right. My mother used to always say that. Am I right or am I wrong? And I used to say to her, yes. I used to say yes. <laughs> Messed her up. All right, here you go. Isaiah tells us of the Messiah, Jesus, to come, the peace of the Savior. The peace. Let me, let me read it for you. There's two charts here, and it's kind of hard to read, but let me read it. The wolf shall lay down with the lamb. Anybody know what he's talking about here? Is that going to happen today? That's the millennium. It's not going to happen today. He's prophesying way out. Mountain peak of prophecy. And the leper shall lie down with the kid, the uh, 
calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall feed God bless you uh, their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and the suckling child shall play in the hole of the asp it's a snake and the wean child shall put his hand in the cockatrice den very deadly they shall not hurt you destroy in all my holy mountain that's Jerusalem by the way for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea so he goes not just from Jerusalem but the whole earth then he goes a little further uh, well that's it by the way and so he says this He's saying this. He's saying a child would be there. To illustrate how the character and governance of Jesus will influence the earth someday, Isaiah talks of Eden restored. That's what he's talking about. That's Eden restored, of global paradise, a Shangri-La that is coming. Wolves and leopards and lions and bears and cobras are all deadly enemies of such defenseless creatures as lambs, goats, calves, cows, and infant children. Yet in the thousand-year reign of Christ in, in the, on the earth, Jesus promises peace for the helpless in creation. You know the ones who are exploited the most in our, in our world? It's the helpless. The helpless. They're pawns. When you have, when you have people, families that are, that are trying to escape El Salvador and coming over our border, and you have politics going back and forth, and you have some people who are criminals that are coming over, some people are just looking for asylum, they're pawns. They're pawns in the political, political mumbo-jumbo. Jesus defends anybody who's helpless. And he, and he shows his wrath on anybody that's guilty. Jesus would be able to separate the people, the guilty from the innocent on that border, easily. And so the thing is, but right now, the innocent, everybody runs on the, on the backs of the innocent. Let me tell you, it's wrong when, and again, the government's probably listening to this too, but that's fine. It's wrong when the IRS garnishes your paycheck and you only make forty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year and Bill Clinton never pays a single cent of taxes. It's wrong, it's really wrong. It's a, it's a backward society. It has no fairness. Why? Because he can afford lawyers that will go against the IRS. It's wrong. It's wrong. We see so many of the innocent that are hurt. It's wrong when televangelists come on TV and, and bleed people for money and little old ladies that don't have a whole lot send their money into them believing that something's going to happen. It's wrong. It's a horrible. It's the innocent. Jesus will always defend the innocent. And you won't see that in the world a whole lot. So yet in the thousand year reign of Christ, the earth, Jesus promises this peace for the entire earth. He eliminates the pecking order, by the way. He reverses the survival of the fittest idea. He does away with the dog-eat-dog -dog mindset, and he places all life in harmony. Such a radical reversal will come about not when we end climate change, <laughs> not when we spend billions to save the spotted owl, not when we stop the slaughter of whales, and not when we replace our plastic straws with paper ones. <laughs> Which, by the way, messes with my head. Let me tell you why. You have to kill trees to obtain paper. So how does that work? I don't get that one. Save the environment by killing it? I just don't get that one. And plus, they don't work. How many of you ever try to suck on a paper straw? I'm carrying my own anymore. It's going to be metal. It's just gonna... <laughs> so it'll come about. Well, how's it going to come about? It's going to come about, as verse 9 says, when the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord. Wow, kind of sets it all in order, doesn't it? Wouldn't you want to live in a world like that? In other words, the contagious sin of Adam and Eve will be eternally forgiven. And all the earth will know that he and he alone is God during what's called the millennial reign of Christ. Where does that happen? Well, let me give you a little eschatology. Since we're going everywhere tonight, let me give you a little bit more. So we're living in the church age, the age of grace. Today's the day to be saved. You can't get saved today. You're going to have some trouble over here. We're going to have the rise of lawlessness, the seven-year tribulation, a real quick thumbnail sketch. The Bema Seat is the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's us. We're there. When the rapture happens, if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, which I do, we're there. We are judged not by our sin. You will never be judged by your sin. You're not going to the Great White Throne Judgment. It's a misnomer. When it, and the ones that go to the Great White Throne Judgment, it's called the second death. Those are people that are in hell. But we're going to the Bema Seat. When, you go to, uh, when those of you who are going with me to Greece go to Corinth, I'm going to show you the Bema Seat Paul was writing about. It's a spot that's elevated that the judge stands on. The Bema Seat for us will be what you've done for Christ. If I give you $10 or $100, and I, and I give you, because God tells me to give you that, and then I go and tell him, that gets negated. It gets, that goes through the fire and it doesn't come out. If I give it to you and I don't let anybody know, then God uses that as a reward for me and I get a crown, I get some rewards from that, crowns. The rise of lawlessness will happen on the earth at that time. And then we know that there's going to be the battle of Armageddon, when Christ will actually come back physically. This, he meets us in the air, he comes back physically. After that, we know that Satan is bound for a thousand years. He's bound for the millennium. Christ rules. And who's he ruling? He's ruling humans that have made it through here without the mark of the beast. And again, that's a lot of things to think about, but they will make it. Some will make it through. 
and that will be the seed of this. This will be an Eden restored, just like Adam and Eve. They'll be fruitful. They'll multiply. They'll die at a thousand years, a thousand years of age. You're going to hear Isaiah tell you about that. The lion and the lamb are going to lie down together in this. This is going to be a total world of peace. Christ is going to be ruling from Jerusalem, sitting on David's throne. He's going to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies, 300 of them, by the way, that it hasn't fulfilled yet. Fill, fulfill 300 when he came, he'll fulfill another 300. Then the great white throne judgment. Satan will come up and he will tempt these people once. Isn't that interesting? How many times does he tempt you a day? Because you're a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. You're, you're chosen to rule. You're chosen to rule these people right here to make it through. But he'll, cho he'll tempt these only once. Just once. They'll surround Jerusalem, try to kill Jesus. A fire will come down from heaven, Second Peter tells us. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, right before the fire, let me tell you this. So he'll try to surround them. Jesus will obviously uh, gather them together and he won't be able to do it. He will, the, the uh, hell will belch up Satan, every demon, every wicked dead called the second death. And they will be cast into the lake of fire which burns forever and ever, their final resting place. There won't be any more hell. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And then what God intended in Eden will go on forever. It's kind of, nobody ever even talks about it. We talk about, well, let's pray so we can get another hundred bucks in our, in our mail today. That's <laughs> ridiculous. This is the big picture. Now watch. So if you want to see it again, here it is. Christ comes. We have the dispensation of grace, church age, tribulation, seven years. The messianic kingdom is a thousand years. After that, it goes on. By the way, the church age is AD 2019 plus. We don't know how long it's going to last. The rapture will stop it. Seven year tribulation will happen. Messiah will be the king on the Davidic throne. Second resurrection followed by the second death and then the eternal order, which is going to be what we're going to do for eternity. We will never die. Somebody say amen. amen. You will live forever. So there's a whole lot more besides just planet Earth. So Isaiah's telling us about it. In the Old Testament, he's telling us about this millennial reign. There's going to be peace on the planet. You still with me tonight? So he gives a little bit further and he tells this. The last thing he says is this. The sign of the Savior. And I want to, I want to read you this one. So it says, And in that day shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign or a sign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and the rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall send his hand against the second time to recover, second time, to recover the remnant of his people. The first time, by the way, is going to be from Babylonian captivity in just a couple, a couple hundred years when he's writing. The second time is a regathering of the people from all over the world, Jews from all over the world. Now listen, because you're living in this. The second time, recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, from the islands of the sea, that's America, by the way. Islands of the sea is everything outside of the Middle East. And he shall set up a sign to the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel to the nations and gather together, disperse the Judah from the four corners of the earth. There's going to be an ingathering of Jews in the second time. Now watch. The enemy, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah, skipping back to where he was, shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, that's his present day, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines towards the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall shake his hand over the river, and that's Nile, and shall smite the seven streams, and make the men go over dryshod. And there shall be a highway in the remnant of his, for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria like it was in Israel in the day that he came out of the land of Egypt. So what is he talking about? What's he saying? Well, talking about a specific prophecy. Notice the phrase, in that day, it starts out. That's always the heading for future prophecy. I'm closing soon. It says, and an ensign, that's another word for a sign to all the people, shall stand like a banner, a rallying cry for all the people and all the nations, verse 10. Like those who climb Everest and plant their national flag in that peak. Something's going to happen in this day. He's envisioning a day when the banner bearing the name of Christ will be unfurled on top of the world. And by the way, the banner of Christ. I've gone to Jerusalem and to Israel 46 times. Many, many times I'll be in Jerusalem and I'll see banners flying, whether it's for a presidential campaign or candidate, or whether it's protesting an American president. So they're used to flying banners. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about there's going to be a banner, probably in Jerusalem, that talks about Jesus being Lord. It's a declaration. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a high point. Another sign in that day will be the Lord reaching out his hand to recover the remnant of his people from the Babylonian exile. That's going to happen. That's the first part of the prophecy. Now get this. Then there's going to be a second remnant coming back to Israel from the four corners of the earth, a worldwide gathering of Jews back to Israel. It's the second prophecy. History records the first return of the Jews came from Babylon exile in 538 BC, over 200 years after Isaiah writes his prophecy. And now get this, you and I are literally living in the days of the second return. We are living in the day in the second part of his prophecy has been fulfilled. Jesus is going to return based on this. Listen, Assyria, he mentions Assyria, they're going to come from Assyria. That's North Iraq, Southeastern Turkey, Northwest Iran, uh, Southern Syria, Egypt, 
Egypt is Egypt itself. Pathros, the south of Egypt, it's now Ethiopia. Kush, Somalia, uh, Somalia, southeast Ethiopia. Uh, Nubia, Sudan, Elam is Iran. He's saying Jews are going to come from all those. Shinar is Babylon. Hamath is Lebanon and Golan Heights. Islands of the sea is the rest of the world. He says they're going to come from the four corners of the earth. Okay, 1,700 years after Isaiah writes this, on May 14, 1948, it happens. The Jews start coming back. It's called an Eliah. They're still coming today, by the way. It's hard to stop them. Let me show you how it's, how it's happening. This is just, this is just uh, immigration from France to Israel from 1995 to 2014. Look at how many Jews are coming from France. This is what's happened so far. 450,000 have come from Canada to back to Israel. Mexico, 42,000. Brazil, 125,000. Chile, 26,000. Argentina, 300,000 Jews have returned to Israel since 1995. Uh, the Ukraine, 25,000. 130,000. 130, in Ukraine, 25,000 in Switzerland, it's a neutral country. Uh, we have Holland, 43,000, Sweden, 25,000, UK, 350,000, Belgium, 40,000. This is not happening in any other ethnic group ever. It's not happening, especially not today. Russian Federation, 380,000 Jews have returned from Russia to, to Israel since 1995. Australia, 125,000. And here's the rest of them. United States, 3,000. By the way, since 2014, that's gone way up. Jews right now, there are more Jews in Jerusalem than there are in New York City, first time ever. And we'll see all these th coming from it. What's happening? There's a great ingathering. This is what Isaiah prophesied. You are living in Isaiah chapter 11. He is ingathering the Jews. You still with me tonight? So, for all, lastly, Isaiah tells us in verse 13 to 16 that the Lord will put down all the enemies of Israel. And by the way, if you want to see some pictures of the Jews returning, El Al flies every single day, five flights that's free to Jews in the world, some, some countries free, for them to make their aliyah back to Israel. Every single day. Every day. So, Isaiah tells us in verse 13 to 16 that the Lord will put down all the enemies of Israel. So let me end tonight by going back to the beginning of the study of my title. And let me clarify that. Not every country gets free, but some countries have free flights from El Al to take their Israeli citizens back, or Israeli Jews back, excuse me, and make them Israeli citizens. Isaiah was waiting for the branch to sprout from a dead stump. I titled this tonight, What Are You Waiting For? So what do we do when we are expecting God to answer our prayers? Let's put it in relative terms. Or even to bring peace to a wicked world. I'm really anticipating Christ coming back. I don't know about you, but I really am. I'm really kind of tired of the world. I'm tired of everything I see. Perhaps we can best do what Isaiah did himself. He said, wait. Wait for God's coming into our world to fully accomplish his purpose for this world. A world that God still deeply loves, continues to love, and sent his only son to be born into. It's like waiting for Christmas. It's what, it's what teaches us. We should be waiting with Christ, for Christ like we're waiting for Christmas anticipating something. Unto us, a child is born. Waiting is often a matter of enduring frustration. Waiting is not something that comes easy for any of us, especially me. But waiting for an answer to prayer or the coming of God's kingdom or the coming of Christ is what belongs to the heart of faith. It's all about waiting. Faith is all about waiting. In the Psalms, there's more than 40 verses that commend waiting, talk about waiting. In waiting, we acknowledge that this world belongs to God and that he's taking care of it and he'll continue to take care of it even when we can't understand it or even when we can't see it. Waiting for the coming of God's kingdom expresses the conviction that God himself, who, he who created this world, will set everything right again. And he's going to. He's going to put it right back to the way it was in Eden, only with you and I a special place in it. It's not by our cleverness and hard work that it's going to be accomplished. It's not by any of our leaders or any of our laws. By only the sovereign God who moves in mysterious ways in his own timetable. So we wait with eager expectation. Waiting, we realize, also implies watching. You can't wait without watching. Many of Jesus' parables and his references to the apocalypse or the end times call on his followers to be watchful in their waiting, to watch. Waiting is not a passive activity. It involves keeping your eyes open, staying alert, and watching. So the question is, what are you waiting for? It also becomes, what are you watching for? And that's the key. So whatever you're waiting for tonight, remember to keep watching for it to come to pass. Because if you're not watching, you may miss it when it comes. The truth be known, somebody said to me the other day, they said, man, I wish God spoke to me. God speaks to us every single day. He's speaking to you in every place you go. We're just not watching for it. We're not waiting for it. Listen to what the Word says. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God. Psalm 132, 123.2. There will be times when the will of God will not be clear to us. During those times and those occasions, we're expected to retain our faith and wait on the Lord. It's not a matter of questioning God when or why. It's a matter of waiting and watching. So tonight, hopefully, 
you gain something from Isaiah and you gain something for yourself. So let's just bow and pray. Father, I thank you tonight. And there are many here tonight, Lord God, that raised their hands that they're waiting for something. I anticipate that a lot of them is a special prayer, a significant prayer. Lord, you are just as involved with us as you, as you were with Israel and you still are with Israel. Every one of our needs you hear, Lord God. And for those of us that are waiting, whatever we're waiting for, an answer to prayer or whatever, Lord, maybe even the, the, the ultimate of you coming back, Lord God, we know that there's a crown given to those who wait for you to come back. Lord, we pray tonight that our waiting would also be filled with our watching, that we'd be mindful, Lord God, and we'd be, we'd be dutiful to watch the things that are around us. The signs are right there. We're watching them happen, which we know as our wait, we're seeing things happen. Lord, maybe in our own personal lives, we need to pay more attention to what's happening around us because we, as we wait, we need to watch. Surely you're talking to us. Bless all those that are here tonight, Lord God. Bless those that are listening to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.